Totally. Our neighborhood is like really safe. There's only one entrance and all the parents kind of keep a collective like side eye out on the kids. And I actually think that's super important. And it's a really big priority for us is letting them go play and have free play and build forts and climb trees and do risky play that helps develop their psyche correctly. And I'm like, it's great if they get a skin knee. It's great if they learn that you, if you climb too high, you fall because then they won't do it again. And they develop that inherent sense of risk evaluation. Hey, 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 it's Andy Petronic, and welcome back. It's episode 144 of the Andy Petronic podcast. This is where it's my job to talk to health, life, and well-being thought leaders about their expertise, success, and the ways to achieve optimum health and fitness so that you come away from each episode full of ideas and inspired for action. Here we are. Here we are. Coming up today, we got Katie Wells. She's best known for her blog and persona as the Wellness Mama. But before that, I've got a few announcements for you. The Whole Life Challenge, this first ever Summer Whole Life Challenge starts on Saturday, July 7th. It is an exciting day. It's an exciting event. It's exciting because it's the first time we've ever done it before. And it's exciting because we're getting back on track. You guys have taken six weeks off. Those of you that participated in the spring, I took six weeks off and uh, it's time to get back to business. It's time to get back into the accountability game. Um, my team name that I, st- I, I usually pick a new team name every challenge. This time is no different. It's going to be called summertime is showtime. Summertime is showtime. And I'd love for you to join me. Just go into the game once you've registered and find a team and look for my team. Summertime is showtime. And um, yeah, I'm going to be uh, restarting my fitness workout blog. So every week of the challenge, I do a body weight workout that um, it can be done in your living room. It's called my living room workout series. I've got 29 of them. So there's a ton if I weren't to do any more. You go to uh, andypetronic.com forward slash workouts and you can find them all. You can find them all written and the whole works. They're follow along videos. So yeah, they're kind of useful. And um, I also have a monthly newsletter where I put out all kinds of tips and tricks and things that I, that are inspiring me, things that are, that I'm checking out, I'm exploring. So um, if you want to subscribe to that, it's called stepping up and that's also on my website at andypetronic.com. Um, I've got a few cool, I got, I got a lot of cool upcoming guests, but I wanted to specifically mention a few of them. Kevin Carter is a former Super Bowl champ and he's a huge philanthropist. He's going to be coming up. Paul check. Some of you have heard of him before. Probably he's a master healer, been known to heal things that are unhealable in the world of backs and shoulders and knees and hips without surgery. He's an amazing guy. Amazing leader thought leader and yeah and then josh mance uh he this guy this guy died and came back to life i had a guy who died three times very short uh (laughs) i I don't look for people who've died i'm starting to think this sounds a little crazy um josh was an army vet and he died for 15 minutes he was dead 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 as a doorknob and uh he came back and he tells his story, and he tells his story not just of that experience, but really of his healing afterwards. So those guys are all coming up in the weeks to come. Today, I've got the wellness mama. Now, Katie is is just about the most normal mom I think I've ever spoken with, and that's probably a lot of her appeal. She's a massive influencer in the world. Um, the advice that she gives to her blog subscribers and followers is um is is really amazing and we get into a lot of stuff she's got six kids she's got a really amazing philosophy about how to raise those kids and about how she intentionally set her life up to lead them in the direction that she feels will will give them the most likelihood for success in their life her her son her 12 year old son has this business project that he's launching it's a podcast. Um, she's uh, she just announced made this 
announcement on our podcast for the first time that she is going to be pursuing getting board certified. She's not a doctor, but she wants to take the, take the boards and become board certified. Um, she's, we have a long talk about infrared and barrel saunas, hot heat saunas. She reads about 200 books a year. We talk about that. We talk about pulse electromagnetic field therapy and the dangers of EMF. Um, you know, I, I don't need to tell you all the things we talk about. We talk about all this stuff. Um, it, it's a really, really great conversation. So I'm not going to wait any longer. Let's bring the wellness mama, Katie Wells, into the podcast. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Enjoy. Katie Wells, welcome. Now we're officially live because I think that little thing probably recorded and we're back like 10 minutes later. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks so, so much for having me. This is so fun. Thanks for being on the podcast. It's really, uh, it's like I said before, it's really cool con- to connect with you. I've been on your website a lot, um, not just to prepare for the podcast, but just in general, like you're like a celebrity. Uh, you are a celebrity. You are a hundred percent celebrity. And yet you're like your mom, your mom, you know, like, so it's really cool that we have this capacity now with the internet and blogging and podcasting and to be able to do that. Like, what a cool thing. It's true. I wouldn't call myself a celebrity by any means, but totally, if you saw me in day-to-day life, you wouldn't think it just doing laundry, doing dishes, raising kids. So, but thank you. It's an honor to be here. Um, now, wait a second. Okay, so one of the craziest things, I read your, first I read when I when I was actually getting ready for this podcast, first I read, you know, the the top part of your bio and and then I got to the bottom, there's some additional randomness. And I'm like, wait a second, this stuff is fantastic. I mean, you met your husband walking across the country? Who does that? <laughs> we did. It was insane. I know, I know I was... you did. I know you did. <laughs> but, but who does that? That's, in, that's great. Like, were you doing it because you met do, while doing it? Were you each doing it independently yeah. and you just like hooked up on the road somewhere? Or it was, was it actually a-, a bunch of college students. We were all in it to raise money for a nonprofit. It was this thing we were going to walk from Los Angeles to D.C. over the course of a summer. We had, the deal was we had to cover every single mile, so collectively. So we walked in groups to cover physically uh, every mile between the two, so okay. over 3,000 miles. And so we had a day shift and a night shift. Half the group walked all night. Half the group walked all day. Oh, my um, gosh. Like 20 plus miles a day for three months. Um, hardest thing I had ever done until I had kids. And the funny part is at the beginning of the walk, like we kind of both just gotten out of relationships. And both of us at the beginning were like, thank goodness, nobody here is my type. I'm just right. going to like walk and work on myself. But this will be great. But it turns out when you walk that many miles with someone, you really get to know them. It's like speed yeah. dating on steroids. Yeah, right. Um, and we, we had the ground rules that nobody could date on the walk just because that would have been awkward. We were all living in an RV together. Yeah, right. Um, so he actually asked me out on the bridge as we walked into D.C. and finished the walk. And the rest is kind of history. Six kids later. Which um, which bridge did you cross going into D.C.? Which Where were you? That is a great question. I don't remember offhand. Was it a big, huge, like, arch it was bridge? Huge. Yes. Might have been the Key Bridge or I grew up in DC, so um okay. I'm just I'm just curious. And I also we have we have this well, a couple things in common. I, I used to do these adventure races where, you know, you're hiking three hundred miles, four hundred miles, and uh so I know what it's like to do long distance trekking. It was a little different because it was in the wilderness and stuff, but um there's nothing like the bonding that happens when you're going mile after mile after mile, hour after hour after hour, you know, on foot. It's really unique. For sure. We've talked about when our kids are teenagers doing either the Appalachian Trail or the Camino or something that would be a long distance hike just for that exact reason. Like before we send them off into the world, just really like kind of tightening those bonds and getting to know them as kind of grown adults. Right, right. I also um, did a bike ride across the country. So um, we went from Camp Pendleton to, uh, to D.C., we we had a, we had an RV following us, so we took some liberties with we. Our rule for ourselves was we could go north south as long as we didn't uh, move f- move in the easterly direction. We could even go west if we wanted to, but as long as we didn't go east in the RV, we were okay. So our big north south jaunt was uh, we got to St. Louis, and then we hopped in the RV and we went up to um, Minneapolis because we had friends up there and, and, and supporters and stuff up there. And then we re, we remounted our bikes from Minneapolis and drove down through Chicago and 
but um that's amazing yeah it's cool. cool it's cool so yeah i had to ask you about that because oh my god i mean that that's insane it's insane and and you have six kids so like that's for me that's insane too what are you it's pretty crazy, are you done i will say are you done are you are the, is that a, oh, it's still an open-ended question we'll see i'm still pretty young so we'll see um I've always said seven's my lucky number, so who knows? But for right now, we're done. We've got a lot going on with life and business and the other kids. So for right now, but um, who knows? How do you do all that you do as a mom or have to do as a mom and all that you do for wellness, for, for the, the world and, and kind of what you've built your website around? Like how, how do you keep that all together? Um, I'm definitely a systems and a checklist person, so that helps. But um, in a sense, I feel like they kind of feed each other and make each other easier in a way. Um, and I also say to anyone who only has a couple kids, having six kids actually forgives a lot of my parenting sins that would make parenting harder because oh. I can't physically spoil them if I tried. I couldn't. Um, and I can't do everything for them all because I don't have enough hands. So we're really focused on making our kids very independent from a young age um, with the idea that we're, we're here to raise adults, not children, and I want them to enter life at 18, um, fully capable of whatever life throws at them. And so to that degree, um, they actually, they carry their weight around the house. We're all in it together. We're totally a team. So I'm not doing every dish myself. I'm not doing everybody's laundry myself. I'm not cooking every meal myself. Even our oldest two can cook a meal from scratch. Um, and so part of that is then I have more time to work. Um, but also we kind of are involving them in the work even now. So we have a rule with the kids that before they can drive, before we'll sign off on their driver's permit, they have to have had a profitable business for a year. So our focus with homeschooling was to finish their core curriculum by about 13 mm-hmm. so that the next few years could kind of be a mentorship where we were helping them start that business and learn, you know, the business planning and how to manage the financial side of a business and how to manage the ups and downs of a business, which certainly happen, um, and learn that failure is great and you learn from it and you move on. Like that to me was a huge lesson that, I had to learn as a grown up, and I wanted my kids to learn early on. So we're in that fun stage now with our oldest of getting to help mentor him into his own business. And um, our couple, the ones below him, have ideas. And so that's been super fun for me because I love the business side and getting to see them kind of ignite that entrepreneurial passion has been awesome. Um, that said, I also try to be very efficient. So my background is in journalism, so I can write very quickly. Um, and writing is kind of my outlet. So writing for the blog is kind of my daily, like meditative journalistic outlet. Um, and I can do it pretty quickly. And then the health stuff, we, we do it as a family. So we work outside as a family. We play outside as a family. We cook as a family. Um, I truly believe that, and like a hundred percent believe that community and family will heal a lot of the health problems we have in the world. And I saw that recently in Europe, they come together as a family every night. Their extended family bonds are so tight. Their immediate family bonds are so tight. Their friendships are so tight. Mm -hmm. And that's a non-negotiable to them. Like family time is a given every night. And I think I went into the trip going, I wonder why Europe is so much healthier. And that was one of the main things I came away with. I think it's because they do community so much better. Hmm. So that's our focus. And all those things that we have to do as a family, we do together. Do you have extended family that lives close by? Like, are you in the vicinity and neighborhood of your husband's family and your family and everyone? Um, We are now with my family, which has been awesome. Um, They're both, my dad's a retired professor and my mom was an accountant who knows multiple languages. So they've been super awesome influences on the kids. And um, we see his, my husband's extended family pretty often too. He has um, five siblings. So it's a super fun extended family. Yeah. Um, But that's also something we made a really conscious decision when we um, recently moved was to find a place where community was definitely a focus. And so we live in a tiny neighborhood, it's only got, I think, 20 houses and there's over 30 kids. Wow. And every day, like right now I'm looking out the window, like 20 kids just rode by on a bike or play <laughs> capture the flag later. Like they never stop moving. We put right. trackers on them and they are running 10 to 13 miles a day just Wait, playing. trackers? Like GPS trackers? No, like um, Fitbit trackers. I would normally never put Fitbits on my kid, but I did it for one day to see how much they're running. Oh. And uh, yeah, it's crazy. So you're not looking, you're not trying to keep track of where they are. You're just, you just were curious how much they're moving around. Totally. Our neighborhood is like really safe. There's only one entrance and all the parents kind of keep a collective like side eye out on the kids. Right. And I actually think that's super important. And it's a really big priority for us is letting them go play and have free play and build forts and climb trees and do risky play that helps develop their psyche correctly. 
And I'm like, it's great if they get a skin knee. It's great if they learn that you, if you climb too high, you fall because then they won't do it again. And they develop that inherent sense of risk evaluation. Um, And they're also learning all this interpersonal skills and working through things with other kids when I'm not there to jump in and make sure no one's feelings get hurt. And it's been really awesome. Was all this by design? Like, how did you come to this? How did you guys figure this out? Because I mean, like, I'm hearing all this stuff you're saying. I, I'm sitting here nodding my head. I'm in agreement with everything that you're doing. And yet I'm not doing it. Um, <laughs> I mean, I've got an 11 year old. I didn't even think of these things when I had my, my kid. Like, part of it, I wasn't capable of doing that because my wife is in, in the movie business and there's no, we can't move to a place that is more like, well, I say we can't. Maybe we could have, but, but anyway, like, how did you guys do this? Um, there's a really cool book called Playborhood that talks about a family that did this in their neighborhood that it didn't exist and they kind of created it. And it has a lot of really good guidelines for how you can just kind of nurture community wherever you are. Hmm. Um, For us, this was really intentional. We purposely kind of looked for areas where we knew there were a lot of entrepreneurs that we knew that there would be kind of kids who had the same kind of parent ideals as we have. Mm -hmm. And also that potentially had more free time and the parents were going to be more involved in more home. There's a lot of people who work from home in our neighborhood. Um, It took a long time. And we actually, basically, I I always say, I will always choose people over things 100% of the time. So we moved to a house we don't like as much, um, but we have people that we love and adore and the kids have friendships that'll be lifelong friendships. So to me, that's not even a question of the trade-off. Right. Um, But it did take us a long time to find it and to then mobilize and get everything logistically figured out to get here. Did you um, do that before you had kids or was this in process while you were, while your, your oldest had already been born or. It was in process after we had kids. I didn't realize, I think having kids helps you like really realize the things that are important in life. Like so many of us encounter and and I think a lot of people come to health for that reason, realizing someone else's life depends on them being healthy longer. And um, for me, just seeing the community and wanting my kids to have involvement with their grandparents and with other Um, like-minded families and just to be able to create those kind of friendships because I actually grew up in a neighborhood where we rode bikes all day long and we played in the woods and built forts and that was a huge priority for me it just took a long time to find out like find a place where it could actually happen so when did you get to where you are now like how long have you guys been there uh, in this house, only a year, but uh-huh. we had been in a house that was like a better step for a few years before that. So it's been a kind of a slow progression. So your youngest are going to get the full advantage. Your oldest is is uh, catching up. Exactly. <laughs> what's the business? Unfortunately. That, what's the business? Is it a is it a boy or girl? Your oldest. A boy. Is he? Um, what's the business that he's thinking about? Is he? Thir- I'm guessing he's 13 or 12. He's actually only 11. He's about to turn oh. 12. He was ahead of the curve. He did. He's the firstborn of two firstborns and super, super type A. So he did everything early. Um, Actually, I can tell you because he's about to launch it. He has a a website and podcast called Greatology. And he is going to be interviewing top performers to basically ask them, like, what did you want to be when you were 11 years old? And why aren't you that? And what were the most meaningful things that happened in your life that led to where you currently are today? And basically, he came to us with the idea and said, like, mom, you talk about this all the time. Our generation is going to face a lot of bad stuff. Mm -hmm. Like... Um, I want to do this to basically like teach my generation what we can do early on. Cause we're, we're going to have to hit the ground running. Right. Oh, I want to be on his podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I'll sign you up. <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds cool. I mean, I, I have this funny, this, this funny background that, that, you know, if you, if you look at all that I'm known for in the world, I was a musician growing up. Like it's completely the antithesis of every, of everything that I've done in my adult life. Um, um, That's awesome. So what I, did you a, play? Or, were I, you a singer? Or what did yeah, you? I played the trumpet. And uh, I grew up in a family of musicians um, and uh, was a pretty high level. I mean, I went to the Eastman School of Music and was studying wow. to be a concert, you know, principal trumpet of a of a symphony. Um, and I was playing gigs and, prof- you know, like the whole thing. The, and I j- just, when I got to college, I just had a this revelation that, wait, there's more to life than just music and trumpet. And I want to explore that. And if I keep going down the road of trumpet, I don't think I thought it through quite like this. It was more like, um, fraternities, beer, uh, girls and part, like I'm going that way. (laughs) (laughs) And, uh, I, for no, you know, now that I think back, I'm like, I think that there was part of me that was like, okay, I need to explore life more, broadly and um i'm I'm glad i did I, I don't know what it would have been like had i not i'm sure that would have been great too 
but um but probably i'm sure that music time and that was important super for your brain development like we know that yeah. music is great for that and so it probably helped you a ton right and where you are today even indirectly yeah totally totally my aunt will never forgive me for not following through and playing the trumpet but you know i remind her that there were incredible benefits from all the studying and trumpet playing that i used to do so um, oh so funny story on that note um my all my extended family all of them are like PhDs or like advanced degree genius people. Mm -hmm. And they still, to this day, because I only have an undergraduate degree, are like, but aren't you going to go get a PhD? Or aren't you going to get a law degree? <laughs> and they don't understand it all. They don't understand the whole, like the internet thing is kind of working out for me. Right. And so they're like, they're really stressed about like, I don't have an advanced degree and what am yeah. I going to do? And um, as so I just keep joking with them, I'm like, I think, I think I'll be okay. I think we kind of have this figured out. We're okay. But <laughs> you should get, you, you know, it's like the wizard of Oz. You should get uh, some wizard somewhere to give you the, the advanced degree for what you're already doing. I mean, I'll give you advanced degree Perfect. I'll signed and dated and the whole thing. And I'll, we'll make up the certificate <laughs> and you can put it on your wall. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> cause, cause I look at what you're doing and I would say you are already living a, an advanced degree. Like you're, you're doing it, you know? So um, it's pretty awesome. I, I wanted to ask you, uh, cause this came up before the podcast. I've been thinking about saunas and stuff and I wanted, and then I said, okay, I'm going to ask you during the podcast. And so it just popped into my head. Um, you have a barrel sauna and an infrared sauna and you use both and you, you also are, yeah. So tell me, tell me about that. Like, tell, like what have you found and why both? And, um, yeah. So if you want to get really geeky with the research, I'll definitely point you to Dr. Rhonda Patrick. She's yes, amazing. I love her. I have a yeah. brain crush on her. Yes. Yeah, awesome. Um, but she's incredibly she geeky. Yes. Very, very I, hard I to it. listen to. In fact, some of the podcasts feel like when she's talking, and I don't know if this is true or not, because I've never spoken to her in real life, but it sounds like everything's written down from a script that she that she does. But I can't imagine that it is like, I think well, maybe she records them live right. in person and video. So there's no, I, I think she's one of those people that's so intelligent that she's probably pre-written it in her head right before she says it. Yes. Yeah. Because that's what it sounds like. Says, um, she never stumbles. Right. right. Like perfectly polished. She's amazing. Yeah. Um, I actually like, I'd love to interview her one day cause she's incredible. Yeah, me too. Um, actually. Yeah, me too. But she writes a lot about uh, saunas in both both types. So the research is kind of divided. I know that like infrared sauna has been the big thing recently, and I think there's a lot of benefits there, but they're not as well researched. Whereas like the just true heat saunas, like the barrel saunas, those have been used for hundreds and hundreds of years in places like Finland. And those are anecdotally, there's tons of evidence. We know they live longer. We know that they have less heart disease. So I think it's trying to balance those two things. Kind of the the ebb and flow is. The barrel saunas or more traditional, those kind of saunas get very hot. Mm -hmm. So they're activating heat shock proteins much more efficiently. And Rhonda Patrick says that like the threshold seems to be about 170 degrees and above. Right. And most infrared saunas don't get to that. But then on the flip side, the research on infrared seems to show that the infrared waves can penetrate deeper into the body. Right. So they're affecting the body differently, but they're not activating heat shock proteins as much. So I kind of view them as two separate things. Hmm. I think they're both super beneficial. And I think most of us don't even sweat enough. So I think right. both are going to make you sweat and that's awesome. Um, but I think they do over time, they do different things. Mm -hmm. And um, actually in Europe, we went in one and it got up to, it was in Celsius. So we turned it all the way up. It was 110. And on my phone later, I was like, I'm curious what that was in um, Fahrenheit, 226 degrees. I was like, whoa, no wonder it felt so hot. Yeah, right. There's a place that I go um, here in LA. It's called City Spa. And it is a Russian, I don't know if it's called, called a bathhouse or a, or a Russian. It's not, a, it's not really a spa. Well, I guess it is a spa. But um, it's got the hot, 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 hot room. And I think it's about 220 and, you know, you literally are cooking. I mean, it's like being in a, you think about your oven at home, you, you know, you put something at 220 and it's warm in 20 minutes. It's not warm. It's like hot. And, uh, right. and then you jump in the cold plunge and they have a super cold plunge. And it's, um, uh, it's very healing for me, like going back and forth between the hot and the cold and, and cycling. I just don't do it enough because I have to get there and it takes me about 30 minutes to get there. If it was in my house, it would be much more conducive to use. But I don't know if there are many of those barrel saunas that go up that that high. I don't know if you just leave it on, if it just keeps going up. They can keep going up. And I know a tip I learned from Ben Greenfield, even with infrared saunas, is probably ask your lawyer and doctor and everyone else before you do this. Yeah, this right, is not right. any kind of advice. But stick a cork in the sensor so it doesn't register the heat as much, and then it'll go higher. That's what they do um, in, the, uh, in the steam room. 
the guys that have been there for a long time or, you know, like I, now I know the secret to get that thing to keep pumping out. They just grab some cold water on a, on a rag and they just squeeze it over top of the thermostat. And boy, that thing just pumps out steam. It gets blazing hot. It's amazing. Steam is harder for me. I feel like I feel more suffocated in steam. It's hard dry to, heat. I can handle a lot longer. Yeah. It's hard to breathe. It's hard to, you know, you start coughing and, and, um, I mean, I enjoy it, but I have, to, it has to be the right time. I can't do it as long as I can do in the dry, the dry heat. For sure. Hey guys, quick reminder. This episode is brought to you by the good kitchen. One of the best things I've ever done is to get pre-prepared whole life challenge, compliant meals delivered to me during the week, especially during the beginning of the whole life challenge. Now look, they make it really, really simple for you. They, they're all compliant. They're keto, they're paleo, they're vegan. Uh, I don't know if they're vegan. They're vegetarian. Uh, they might be vegan. I'm not sure. Um, but you, they'll deliver it right to your doorstep via FedEx. They come in these sealed containers that are vacuum packed. Uh, they stay in my refrigerator. They, they're good for two weeks in the fridge. They're fantastic. They taste delicious. They, uh, I don't even heat them up. To truth be told, they're supposed to be heated up in the microwave or on the stovetop, and I don't even do that. So try it out. It, come on, just try. I mean, look, do whatever you want, but it's changed. It's been a massive game changer for me. If you try it out, you get 15% off your first order. Just use this link, thegoodkitchen.com forward slash WLC. Now let's get back to the episode. Um, I, you know, I also read in your bio that you're a speed reader and you know, that is really, that's something that I, Tim Ferriss got me interested in it. Um, because I, I'm, I'm constantly behind in my reading. I'm I, I, there's so many books that I want to read and there's so many, you know, I, I've also toyed around with the idea of joining one of those. Um, I can't remember the names of the websites that do kind of the, they put together like a 20 minute synopsis of the, the, the entrepreneurial books that I'm interested in or the health books that I'm interested in. And I, and I feel, I feels like cheating to me. Like, I don't feel like I really want to do that. Um, and I tried the speed reading. I don't know how much of a difference it made. Can you tell me about your experience in speed reading and how you got doing that? And, um, if it, you know, like how fast do you read? Yeah. <laughs> it's really cool. Um, so I can read a book in about half an hour. What? Usually. <laughs> Depending on the length of the book. If it's really long, it takes longer than that. I but, can't even, um, you can flip the pages that fast. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, so I taught myself in middle school and it was more actually like totally self-serving. I wanted more time to play with my friends right? and I wanted right. to have to do schoolwork less. So I was like, well, I can, if I can read faster, I can shorten my time of schoolwork. Yeah. Right. Um, and I've always had like a somewhat photographic memory. So I, I read mm. really early and I never read the normal way. So my hair, parents are both um, hearing impaired. My dad's legally deaf. So growing up, we didn't um, watch TV with the sound on. We watched TV with captions. Oh. So I grew up reading the captions and I would just kind of like take a snapshot of the captions versus like trying to read. So I never learned like the phonics or they're like reading along a line. I just kind mm. of learned to like snapshot and absorb the whole thing. And so when I was learning speed reading, I just kind of, adapted that to like, I would just kind of snapshot a whole paragraph and then like kind of comprehend it as I went versus trying to like see every word. Hmm. Um, I feel like that's what slows us down a lot is trying to like actually mentally hear the word as we're reading it. Yes. And yeah. so when I took that away and I was able to like kind of let go of that, just absorbing paragraphs so I can just kind of take them in. And then it does take me like a couple hours to like fully have mentally have wrestled with the concept and get, comprehended all of it, mm -hmm. but I can take in the information very quickly wow. so that I don't have to be in front of a book. Do you think that's something that is learnable, like at, at an older age? Like I know you, you probably have a pretty big advantage in the fact that you started when you were eight or ten or however old. Um, like, yeah. What do you or do you and do you or do you need to have the gift of photographic memory in order to be able to read that fast? Like, how? What What are your thoughts on? Have you seen anybody? Have you taught anybody how to do this? And um, I've seen people learn. I've taught my kids a little bit. Um, I try not to push them into anything. So they're not super interested yet other than my oldest. And he's used a website called Spreeder, uh -huh. which kind of teaches you like just speeds up your tracking so you can huh. take more and quickly. Right. And I know Jim quick also has a speed reading course. Okay. Um, and I think those are both really helpful. I know adults who have taken Jim's courses and drastically improved how fast they can read. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting that, that Tim has this like five minute exercise that you do where you start to narrow the width of the where your eye tracks. Um, I mean, the first thing actually he talks about is how 
we whisper, he, we, we're actually, most people when they're reading, they're actually talking to themselves when they're reading and that slows you way down. And I didn't even realize I was doing that and I was doing that. And then when I stopped doing that and then I started to, he's like, okay, we'll draw lines in down the sides of each col- um, column of the book and only let your eye track from line to line. And so you use your peripheral vision to see the words on the outside of the line. And then gradually you move that, those lines closer together. I mean, that's as far as I got, but I, I saw my, my, um, my words per minute or my pages per minute definitely increase when I did that. I, but I probably need to enroll in some sort of course to keep me on track. Cause it's so, I mean, I, being a lifelong learner, like I'm, I'm going to constantly be behind. Like I, I <laughs> just, there's so many things I want to read. The curse of the curious for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, we're okay. So what, what area can we, can we go into now? Cause there's so much, there's so much, like, I just love that, like the, the integration that you've had. What, what, what is the newest thing actually right now? That's what's, what's newest on your plate in terms of where, where the direction you're headed and your focus in your, in your business or in your life with your, with your kids. Um, so we've got some like physical products in the works that will be hopefully coming out in the next year. Just kind of, I saw needs in different uh, areas and I'm trying to fill those. Um, but as far as the research side, cause like you, I, my research is never done. I'm fascinated by it. So I've been researching like um, PEMF, pulsed electromagnetic therapy. Uh-huh. Um, and that's what I've been fascinated with. And also just the, the EMFs in general, because I feel like this is about to become a very big issue in the health world and a very right. controversial one. Because you have people on the one side saying, if it's non-ionizing radiation, it's safe. And then you have people on the other side saying, no, it's actually affecting our mitochondria and our cellular function. And there's a lot more to it than that. And I think that, um, like, I can see both sides. I totally understand where the medical community is coming from. They're looking at studies that non-ionizing radiation, so if it's not x-ray or gamma waves, it doesn't have an immediate dangerous effect on the body. And, and what but, we're talking about for everybody else out there is, is the, <clears throat> the wavelengths that are going on in your house, right? From your, from wi- especially from Wi-Fi. I mean, that's really the... From Wi-Fi, cell phones. Um, yeah. Although now even smart meters, smart... Ref- most appliances are putting out Wi-Fi or Bluetooth signals all the right, time. Right. Um, the experts I've talked to, actually Xboxes and PlayStation's video game consoles are the oh. worst offenders in most houses. Oh, really? They're horrible. And they don't go to sleep. Like, even when they're yeah. off, they're not actually off. Yeah. Um, so they like people recommend just putting, if you have those in your house, just putting a timer on the surge protector that they're plugged into. So they go off at least at night. Right. Um, and I kind of, I've been wrestling with this issue because I feel like it's something we're going to need to address. Like certainly our ancestors did not have to deal with Wi-Fi all the time. Yep. And we don't know, we don't have a long enough amount of data to know for sure how long it's going to affect us. Um, but I think it's something that's worth being aware of and like doing the research on. And I think it's something that our current medical community is going to have to wrestle with at some point. Um, and I also think at the end of the day, technology is not going away and none of us would want it to. So we need to find a way to integrate it safely into our lives because nobody wants to get rid of their Wi-Fi, and nobody yeah. wants to get rid of their cell phone. It's not going to happen. Right. So um, I would try to really research safe solutions that are easy. So like for us, we just have a timer also on the search protector where our Wi-Fi modem and router are uh-huh. and it goes off at night because um, your cells are in a much more susceptible state when you're sleeping to any kind of electrical impulse. And so if you can get rid of it at night, you get rid of actually like 70 to 80% of the potential damage. So that's one way it's like we can still use the internet during the day and just turn it off at night when you're not using it anyway. Whether or not you think EMFs are dangerous, that's actually pretty common sense and you're saving electricity. So things like that, that's kind of been my current research project. Um, just trying to figure out a non-scary, non-fear-mongering way to kind of breach this topic for a lot of people. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, I think about our Wi-Fi and we don't do that currently. Um, we use a, we use a Wi-Fi extender, so it's probably even worse because it's called the Eero and it's, um, we, we just live in a house that's when you, when you have a stucco house and these concrete walls, the, the Wi-Fi signal doesn't make it through a lot of walls. So there were a lot of dead zones in our house. So we got this thing that extends the network and makes it better. But, um, it's, it's on my radar, but it's not something I've spent a lot of time researching, but probably that surge that t- putting a timer on your router is just probably the easiest fix. Um, that seems yeah, it's so like a $10 simple on Amazon fix. And yeah, good. right. I mean, even if I just set it for like midnight to five in the morning, just so that nobody got like cut off, like, like, like my, if my wife's up doing emails or whatever she's doing later at night when her, uh, you know, for work, um, the, uh, 
I wouldn't want her to get cut off, but even if it was just five hours, it would be really actually maybe beneficial. Yeah, big reduction, especially for kids. That's supposed to be really important because they're in that you're hopefully at night when you're sleeping and parasympathetic when your hormones are shifting. So you're more susceptible to a lot of different inputs. And so that's, I think that's an easy way to reduce a lot of the exposure. Yeah, right, right. Um, yeah, it's, re- it's a really fascinating topic. You know, there, there's another, um, it was funny when you first mentioned that, I thought of a product called a called the Beamer. Um, uh, do you, are you familiar with the Beamer? I've seen it. I haven't delved into it much, but I've seen it. A friend of mine is, um, they're doing a thing this coming weekend on with psychedelics and some sort of a pulse wave electrical electro I, yeah, I, I can't even begin to tell you what it is. And he wants me to come and I, I'm, I'm curious. I'm, I'm curious about it. I don't know how curious I am. If I'm curious enough to go spend three hours at a, at a thing on it on a Saturday afternoon. But, um, yeah, it's from what I understand of the technology, it's, um, the idea that we're kind of bombarded with AC current all day from electricity, from computers. That's what the current has to be, to be, um, like in our electrical system, Mm -hmm. but the earth and our kind of native human body of electrical current should be DC current. So most of these PEMF or pulse electromagnetic devices are basically just returning you to that like same current. Oh, and a lot of them are mimicking like the earth's resonant frequency, which would be found in places like Sedona yep. and you know, places people go for healing. Right. Um, so that's kind of the idea. It's supposed to help put your body in a lower state of inflammation and stress and be more susceptible to healing is the, the science behind it. That's really interesting. So I'm going to pull these, um, these, these dog tags that I wear out. Um, I, I got these at paleo FX. I saw this demonstration. It's probably one of the most wacky things I've ever done because I don't really, I don't, I'm a skeptic in, of all this stuff, like all this stuff that looks like hocus pocus and I can't see it. If I can't see it and demonstrate it, I don't get it. But I actually paid 300 bucks for these little dog tags and they're, they're made by a company called pure harmony. And supposedly the resonance that these little holes or the way these things are, are tuned they tune to your body so they're not really no good for anybody else and they you wear them up against your body one of them is for activity the one that's got the the um lightning on it the lightning bolt on it is uh for activity and the other one is for like balance um somehow uses the the harmonic resonance of the wavelengths that are going into your body and tunes them in accordance with what your body needs and I saw the, the Robert, I can't remember his last name, who did the demonstration, work with about eight or 10 different people, and then myself, and function and pain and capacity changed so remarkably within 20 seconds of putting this thing on that I was like, okay, I, ha- I have to have one. And the, there's this pain that I've... Um, had on and off for probably five years on the right side of my body when I, when I deadlift or when I do lunges, especially, or when I, um, after I run, when I walk up and down the stairs afterwards, I get this weird knee pain, like it's very strange, you know, like almost feels like an injury, but then it always end up, ends up going away after like two days. That has not occurred once since I put these on. So I, you know, there, there's something about us being, uh, electrical energetic beings that I believe that I, that is very hard for me to grasp because I don't, there's no evidence. There's nothing I can really sink my teeth into. You have to just, at some point, I think so far you have to just believe that that's true and you have to kind of go with it. Yeah. I didn't make it to that booth at paleo FX, but there definitely is. I think the science is growing on that idea. Um, and kind of, I've heard it described as a pyramid type approach. Like for a long time, we thought of the body as just purely like physical, biological. It's like a system of levers and tissue and whatever. And then we really started to understand the chemical level of the body and how everything we put into us impacts the body on a chemical level and how hormones work and how supplements work and drugs and medicine. And now we're starting to understand kind of that base of the pyramid, which is the electrical part of the body, which is so new and definitely emerging and hard to wrap your head around, I feel like. But when you think about the heart is an electrical muscle, the brain is an electrical muscle, every cell has a mitochondria, which is an electrical based. We have basically every cell in our body has electrical impulses. So it makes sense, but it's definitely a huge concept to wrap your head around. Um, There's a good book called The Body Electric, if you haven't read it, that goes into a lot of it. How how many... (laughs) 
I just thought of this. How many books have you read? I mean, my God, if you're reading a book every half hour, how do you keep track of them all? My, your, in, your library must be massive. Do you like to read on a Kindle? Do you read on a, do you read by hand? I, for a long time, I stuck to physical books and I was a purist. Like I only like physical books. And then with traveling, I've gotten, I actually love my Kindle. I have a paper white because I don't like the backlit ones. Yeah. Um, just because I can carry 200 books with me on a Kindle versus right. I'm not going to do that in a suitcase. So, um, but I, I don't know. I don't know how many I've read. I, a couple hundred a year for right. since seventh grade. Do you slow down on the Kindle because you have to swipe and go through the pages or is it pretty much just? No, actually, like I take the font a little bigger so it's even easier to absorb paragraphs. And I just pretty uh, much just do a paragraph per page and just like constantly be like tapping to new page. Yeah, right. Right. Oh, it's really interesting. I, I think that's a fascinating topic too, like the way people read and whether they read physical copies or or uh, the Kindle. Kindle's just so, you're right. It's Kindle so convenient. I mean, I don't read that many books, but I can take five with me and uh, bounce around. So it's cool. Yeah. What, um, so of, of, of all the things that are, you know, that you are, I, cause it's funny with somebody like you that, that has so much breadth of knowledge and, 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 and information and stuff that you absorb, what are the things that keep you up at night now? What are the things that you're like, that are really, really important to you either personally or, um, professionally, like in what you're sharing that, that are, that are, you know, significant. Um, well, I've done a lot of work to try not to stay, keep up at night too much because sleep <laughs> is always my nemesis. Yeah, right. Um, but totally get what you're saying. Um, so from the kid's side, obviously as a parent, it's always wanting to make sure hopefully I'm doing things right for them and knowing I'm still going to make a ton of mistakes at the end of the day and hopefully they'll forgive me. Um, but just looking at the statistics, what got me into blogging and what keeps me in blogging and so passionate is the statistics about our kids' generation because – I think we started to see it in my generation as far as all these rising health problems. Like I had Hashimoto's and was, it was horrible before I, it took years before I got a diagnosis, mm. um, got to a really bad place in my health and realizing that our kids are going to face even worse and that's not okay with me. And I think I truly a hundred percent believe it's all reversible. I just think we need to start being a lot more conscious of our inputs, what we're putting into our body, what we're surrounding ourselves with. And like I said earlier, the community, I think that statistically heal so many things. It's actually statistically more important than exercise or quitting smoking. Like it's that important. Right. Um, but so that kind of keeps me up at night is how can I, because I don't want to come at it from the fear side. I think moms already have enough stress and fear and worry right. as it is. I don't ever want to be the voice of fear, but how can I create a positive movement in any direction that's going to actually help moms to be calmer and more sane and less stress. And at the same time, improve these odds for our kids because we've never seen autoimmune disease, diabetes, cancer, heart disease on the rise at the rates that they are. And especially in children, like right. it's completely unheard of. Right. And we have kids because of these environmental factors that are out of parents control going through puberty at like seven, eight, nine years old. This is just completely unheard of. And I think we need to take some serious steps. And I think um, at the end of the day, I think it comes from parents because I've never been one to think the government's going to fix any problem. They're way too inefficient for that. Yep. I think private industry is better because they have a profit motivator. So they have to be efficient in order to make money. But I think at the end of the day, parents are the ones who have the true motivation because we actually really deeply care about our kids and their life and their future. And I think when we can unite enough of us that we truly have the ability to change that. Right. Right. How, how do you help people who are so bought into the system and to, traditional medicine and doctors, it, it's a frustration that I have. Like I look around my son's baseball team or my son's soccer team. And I look at some of the kids and some of the parents and, and some of the, some of the issues that I see going on that I think I would, the way I, be, I think would make a difference if they would go down that road. And there, there's no, you know, I might, I might broach the topic, but there's no, you know, there's no traction. How do you deal with that? And what, do, what do you see? And, and how do you, how do you do that? How do you do that? I think that's one of the toughest struggles of life. Cause I know for a fact that I've never changed anyone's mind by arguing with them and right. that force almost never is effective. And even with my kids, like if they, if I can wait till there's a scenario where they come to me with a question or they're open to a situation, it's going to have a much more deep impact on them than if I try to force my opinion on them, especially yeah. when it comes to food. And that's the last thing I want is to ever create any kind of uh, food issues or health issues in my kids. Yeah. And the same with other people, other parents I interact with. And it's, I, it's so tough because even my nieces and nephews, sometimes these things that I'm just like, Oh, it kills me. Cause I love these kids so much, 
but I also know I'm probably only going to alienate my people I love if I try to force it. So as hard as it is, I try to just position myself as being able to answer any questions whenever they're asked Mm -hmm. and to like have enough research and knowledge that I can hopefully be a good resource to people and realizing that just like with me, eventually the medical system will fail because it's amazing for trauma and accidents or contagious diseases. Like if I was going to be in a car accident, I'd want to be in a car accident in America, 100%. But they haven't quite caught up to um, chronic disease or to underlying issues that aren't just caused by an immediate one, like cause and effect result. Like even though I wouldn't necessarily always do it, you can treat most things with antibiotics and get better, or you can set a broken leg and it gets better. But chronic disease gets so much more complicated. And I don't feel like the medical system has fully caught up to that. And I think people eventually get frustrated with it. So I've tried to be just the voice of like, I get it. I've been where you are. I know how hard it is. And I had to become my own advocate and find my own answers. And here's what I learned and hopefully it can help you. Um, And even the website, I tried to position every blog post as an answer to a question. So when someone Googles something, I can just answer their question, hopefully lovingly and positive way. I, that's always tried to be my focus. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the same applies in personal relationships. Like we, if we live healthy and we are thriving and vibrant, then hopefully people will ask, like, why do your kids never get sick? Or, right. you know, like it is a, a topic for conversation, but it's so tough because I do sometimes wish I could just like wave a magic wand and right. kind of infuse this knowledge into the whole world. And um, it's so hard to see people suffer, especially people you love. And I get it. Hey there, this is Andy, and a quick reminder that this podcast lives and breathes based on your word of mouth. If you've heard anything in this podcast that you think might be useful to somebody else in your life, please pass them on a link. Send them the episode, send them a link to the blog post, send them a link to the actual podcast, and subscribe. I can't continue to get great guests if I don't continue to build the audience. And the only way we build the audience and change the world together is by you guys spreading the word. Please do it. Um, The other way to do it is to write a review. So if you like the podcast, if you love the podcast, please go to iTunes. I've made it really easy. Use this link, bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash Andy Petronic podcast. It will open up the podcast in iTunes and you can find the ratings and review sections and leave a review. Um, and I really, really appreciate it. I really appreciate you being a listener and I really appreciate you sharing it and reviewing the podcast. Thanks again. Let's get back to the show. Do you find that people, uh, need, do do you, do you, do you ever get frustrated with people who need uh, a PhD behind somebody's name or a doctor MD behind their name? Like, Oh, well, the doctor says to do this. So that's what I'm going to do. Uh, in spite of everything that I read on every website or your website or whatever, like, how, how do you deal with that? Or have you experienced that? I'm sure you have. Oh, totally. I get that a lot. Uh, one of the biggest frustrations for sure, especially because, I mean, I obviously don't write from the position of an MD or PhD. Right. Um, and I, like I said, my whole extended family, they all are. So even in my right. own family, I sometimes <laughs> get looked down on of like, oh, but yeah. you don't know anything because you don't have a PhD. Yeah, right. Um, I think it's also about shifting the conversation. And I think that's starting to happen. Like there's companies like SteadyMD and healthcare sharing that are kind of changing the conversation about healthcare. And I think it's, the big thing is educating people that we have to be the primary uh, advocate for our own health and that we are hiring doctors as consultants. Right. And there are some really awesome ones, but you should have the final say of your health information because at the end of the day, if the doctor messes up, you're the one who's dead. So you should right. have the final say of your health information and you should be the one who's researching. You can't just outsource that just like you wouldn't outsource any other important decision in your life right. to someone else. Um, I think it's partly that it's shifting the conversation, but, um, that said, I haven't really shared this publicly yet, but I'll share it here. Um, I am studying to take the boards, the medical boards. Wow. Um, just, we'll see if the photographic memory can come in handy for all those pharmaceuticals, but <laughs> of course it basically will. <laughs> just, just to say, I'm like, no, I'm not a doctor, but I've read like 4,000 studies and I have taken the boards. And if I pass, I'll be able to say I passed the boards and not all doctors can. And I actually like, I understand medicine and I understand the human body. Um, but I think, I think that's one of the things that's shifting in our society too, because, um, for so long we've had this idea all throughout education, not just the medical system, that a degree equal a higher level of intelligence or achievement. And that's even shifting. Like, I think we're not by any means really forcing our kids to go to college unless they choose something that they really need to go to college. I much prefer them to be entrepreneurs, even though I know how hard it is. Um, but I just feel like 
school was amazing when we were in the industrial era and you were going right. to go work in a job for eight hours and you needed to be trained to work in a job for eight hours and to follow instructions and to work within a group in that way. But right now, across the board, medicine and everywhere else, we need critical thinking problem solvers who think outside the box and who will challenge the rules because that's what actually fixes things. Right. So in a sense, I'm raising like six little hellions who challenge the rules. But my hope is that it, as adults, they'll challenge the status quo and fix things because I think I think it's not just isolated to medicine. The people asking, why don't you have a PhD or an MD? And I can't, I don't consider you a credible source. Right. I think it's across the board. We need to value um, not traditional education as much. I think we need to value innovation and critical thinking and self-motivated education more. Well, I, what I hear you saying is, is personal experience rather than research and book knowledge. And I mean, not that book knowledge and research is bad, but um, people are... I think I think one of the traps today is people get roped into research research. I need more research. I need more information. I need to understand this more and they and they they end up go and if they choose the wrong place or the wrong expert and they end up listening to that expert and they're not willing to explore and experiment on their own and be wrong and maybe go down one path and then ah no that wasn't quite right for me. I'm going to um you know, I'm going to alter to the left or to the right just a little bit. And I think if we teach our kids to be more explorative and more capable of being resilient when they, you know, hit a, a stumbling block, it will, it will encourage them to be explorers, you know, like adventurers and explorers. Absolutely. And a few practical things I'll mention that we do, um, if they're helpful to anyone else is with anything we, um, so I did this a couple of years ago. Basically I wrote down everything I believe to be true. And then I purposely challenged myself on every single thing because my reasoning was if I am right, then reading the opposite is only going to strengthen my viewpoint because I'm then going to understand. And if I'm wrong, I should be willing to consider the other side. Yep. And so this is something we tell our kids too, like don't ever trust one source, consult at least five sources before you consider anything a fact. Um, mm -hmm. And then practically we start every day with them with three Ted talks. And I got this advice from a friend, basically the idea that a Ted talk is someone who's the best at what they do. And they're summing up their entire career in 15 minutes. Right. And so you're able to absorb a ton of knowledge in a very short time. But we listened to three unrelated TED Talks. So they're on completely different topics with the idea that kids are wired and adults to connect the dots. We're, we're like wired to find patterns because that was part of survival for yep. so long. So if you give them unrelated things every day, eventually like their brain's going to start being able to connect dots there. And if they watch one on say like robotics and pollution in the ocean and um, like bioenergetics and science, maybe they'll figure out how to make a robot that cleans the ocean and gets rid of the plastic. You know, like maybe right. you're priming them for that. Yep. Um, so that's one of the ways that we do that. Well, and I think cool. for adults and kids, um, even if you don't have kids and you're listening, that it's also about the questions we ask. Yeah. And so we ask our kids every day, what are you grateful for? What did you fail at today? And what hard question did you ask today? Because I think those are the three questions that will serve them to be able to like mentally wrestle with those every day as they go forward. Is that something that you do at night, like before bed? Or when do you ask those questions? Um, it depends. Usually at dinner time, huh. but sometimes breakfast, depending on the day. Right, right. That's really cool. We do, we, do a grat we do a grateful practice. We do it usually before bed. And the problem with doing it before bed that I, that I run into a lot is, you know, like a complete exhaustion and like, okay, it's past your bedtime, which in the summertime happens more often than not. And we got to go right to sleep. So that might be a good idea that's to true. shift that. Well, and like I said, we're huge fans of the non-negotiable family dinner. And so right. that's a great time for conversation. And, um, pretty much our rule is if anything interferes with dinner time, it's, it's not going to happen. Right. Right. That's cool. I, I, I love that too. We have a tradition of that as well, but with my son plays baseball and soccer. And so, it, um, practices tend to go over dinner time. So we, we have to kind of be creative in, in how we do that. Like if we go out and grab food, you know, we sit down and eat a burrito at eight thirty at night. That's our family dinner time sometimes. Yeah. Um, I wanted to go back to what you said about the boards. What does it mean to take the boards? And I didn't even know that was an option for people. Like you, can anybody do that? Um, I'm hoping that they'll let, me do it. I think I can. I have a doctor who will kind of help me get in with them to take it. So basically, um, I still couldn't practice medicine. Obviously, I yeah. didn't go to medical school. Um, but it's just, it's basically a check mark of um, medical knowledge because doctors can practice without taking the boards. It's kind of an added thing that they can say board certified in. Oh, right. Um, right. So I'm hoping I can just take the test and that 
they'll let me. I'm, I'm pretty sure I can. That would be well, kind of a bummer if I study and I can't. Yeah, right. What would they tell? What would they? Would you? Would they give you something and say, "Hey, I'm, I passed the boards." I'm like as a non doctor. Like that's just an interesting. I, I would get this certificate that says I passed it. I don't think yeah, I right. can do anything with it, but <laughs> be a very expensive piece of paper. Yeah, right. No, but it's uh, it's a that's a pretty cool concept. I never. It's it'd be like going to um, it'd be like going to pass the ball um, the um, what's the law school one called the bar yeah the bar the bar I'm like the board the bar. what is it called again <laughs> going to pass the bar and not having gone to law school like huh interesting yeah that's really cool um what are some of the ways you keep yourself organized each day and um, keep your life together because you, you you do seem to have a lot of components like are there any apps you use are there tools that you use like that are you know like your what's your organization system for keeping everything going it's pretty basic i would uh, some i guess i'm technically a millennial but some younger millennials could probably give me some tips on apps to use but um pretty much manage everything with just google calendar google drive um and then the notes app on my phone Mm -hmm. Um, both like work stuff and kids stuff and scheduling. And I just keep a to-do list of the top three priorities for the day. And if I finish those, I consider the success. Um, and a lot of days, if I only get through those and then there's family stuff, that's what happens. And that's awesome. Um, but it helps me really keep a focus of what are the biggest priorities and to focus on those first. Because I think all of us, no matter what we do, it's so easy to get on a computer and then get in like Facebook, Instagram, like email loop and then that's your whole day or you hit noon and you're like, oh, now I have to actually do work. Right. And so I try to really protect against that. And that alone, like I, ref- I don't have any of those on my phone. I don't have social media on my phone because yeah. I'm living in the dark ages, obviously. Um, but it, it really helps my productivity a ton. How do you, um, how do you decide what the, cause I, I always, I have that, I have a dilemma in, in terms of deciding what my top three priority things are. Cause I try to do that as well. And I'm not always successful at doing that. Like, I, I feel like sometimes I maybe fear of like failure of like, yeah, what, what does it say about me if I can't get my top three things done? Um, I don't know. What, what, do you have a process for that or do you do it first thing in the day? Like, when do you choose them and how do you choose them? I do it first thing in the morning. Usually I'll brainstorm them while I'm either showering or doing, like we talked about the juve light or wave vibration or one of the health things that I do. And then yeah. I just put them in my app on my phone and just immediately tackle them. Cause that's usually right now, either the kids are working on school projects and I can work while they work or they're right now they're outside playing. Mm-hmm. So I have more time in the summer. Right. Um, it, it took me a long time cause I am a perfectionist and a control freak and I'm in recovery, but for years <laughs> I would try to get help. I, would, I tried to hire someone to help me with the blog and then I wouldn't let them do anything because right. I was like, Oh, right. well they, they're not going to do it right. And it took a long time for me to finally be like, actually, not only are they going to do it, is good. They're, sometimes they're going to be better because they have more right. bandwidth and they're not stressed and they don't have like everything else going on. So part of it, my to-do list used to be the top 10 things every day and now it's down to three. Wow. So that was a huge accomplishment. Yeah, right. Right. Um, it just trying to hone in on what are the things that I feel like are like my unique things that I can add the most value to people by doing. Mm-hmm. So those are my criteria for what makes the list. And usually it ends up being writing or podcast or um, things where I can help try to like create more information to put out into the world. And then I have people now, thankfully that help so much with the scheduling and the emails and that kind of stuff that I'm not only not efficient at, I'm not good at. So, right, right. um, it took a long time though, to get to that point. Cause like I said, I, I used to just hire people and not let them do anything. Are you specific with your choices of like most important tasks, you know, or do you just say podcasts or blog blog today? Or do you actually say, okay, no, this blog post is going to get done by the, by the end of the day, or this podcast is going to get recorded. Um, very specific. And so today, for instance, my top three, um, I woke up early. I wrote an email that has to go out tomorrow. I wrote a a blog post that has to go out tomorrow. And then I have recording six podcasts in a row. So those are my top three. Got it. And then, then I will cook dinner and go to bed. Um, (laughs) that's right. It's a big day. It's a big (laughs) day. Because the introvert of me will die a little from, I love talking to people, but it does wear me out. Yeah. Right. Um, Of course. But those would be my top three, but some days are much easier. Some days it's just like, write a blog post, write a dedicated email and make sure social stuff is approved for the week or whatever it is. Right. Right. What, um, what, what is your morning routine? Like, how do you make sure that you're at your living at your best and how do you carve out the time for you? Um, given that you have six kids and a husband and you know, a lot of stuff going on in your house. That was also a long time work in progress because I am by nature a night owl and I love like the quiet time at night when the kids are in bed. I love the chaos when they're awake, but I love the quiet when they're asleep. And so for years I would like stay up at night, just like 
hanging out with my husband or watching a movie or something to decompress after the day. Yep. And just realize like I track my lab results a lot and my, my blood levels don't love that. So um, we finally made the switch to going to bed between nine and 10 every night, which I never thought I would be that person. Hmm. Um, but then we can wake up at six or seven, totally rested because we just slept for 10 hours. Yep. And um, especially if you wake up at six, the kids aren't awake because they run, like I said, 10 to 13 miles a day, even during the school year. Right. So they go to bed at nine and we go to bed at nine, they're out for it longer. Yep. So in the morning we have our time together and um, typically like we'll, work out, we'll do wave vibration, we'll do sauna, we'll do the juve light, we'll do any combination. I don't, I don't do everything every day. In mm -hmm. fact, I don't think it's good to do anything every day, even supplements or anything. I rotate everything, but we'll do some combination of those every day. And then if we're not fasting, like right now we're fasting, but if we're not fasting, um, we'll drink either some coffee or like a mushroom coffee or matcha or something mm -hmm. in the morning and just kind of um, that's our time to kind of plan the day and hang out. And then the kids usually wake up and we do breakfast together. When you say we, is everything you do in coordination with your husband? Do you guys do basically follow the same stuff all the time? For the most part. So he um, also owns an online business. So we, there's a lot of overlap and he um, is very tech savvy and kind of a tech guru. So he helps me with the website oh, cool. as far as the tech side. Right. So we touch base on that pretty often. Um, and then now that we work together so much, we have a lot of travel that's together that we have to coordinate and like big projects that are coming down the pike. And so he's very much involved with everything I do, but he also does all this other stuff on his own. So he's at least as busy as I am, if not more so. Wow. So what are some of the specifics of the, of the things that you would drop into your morning routine? Like I heard you say work, work out, you do pulse there. Like what are some of those things that are like, do you journal, do you meditate? Like, w w yeah. Meditation is my list to conquer for this year. Um, I do breathing stuff. I don't, I wouldn't say I'm good at meditation yet, but I'm definitely trying to work on it. Um, but the, as far as devices go, so we have pulse elect electromagnetic therapy. We have the saunas. We sometimes do cold therapy, like ice baths, mm -hmm. um, the weight vibration, the juve light. Um, we have ozone machine. There's another one called the nano V, which is like a super oxygenated, like thing that you breathe. But I usually do that when I work. Um, and then there's a whole host of other kind of biohacking devices that we sometimes use for fun. There's one for heart rate variability. Mm -hmm. That's good for keeping your heart rate steady and low throughout the day. Um, those are kind of the big ones that typically in the morning, sometimes other stuff will happen in the afternoon, but those are the, the morning ones. What do you like to do for your workouts? Um, right now, because we live in an awesome place, it's usually outside. Mm -hmm. Um, I love lifting weights. So we do have to go to a gym for heavy weights because we don't have all of those. Um, but other than that, we have kettlebells at home and like pull up and, um, punching bag and all that, like battle ropes and all that. So uh -huh. we'll typically do stuff outside. Um, the slack line, our kids slack line is the biggest workout ever trying to balance on that. Yeah, day. totally. Um, so it's usually trying to be outside as much as possible and, you know, get embarrassed by how strong our kids are compared to us, but right, 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 right. It's fun. And is your husband, does your husband take the lead in the workouts or do you take the lead in the workouts and, or, or do you guys kind of put them together? Do you have a program you follow or is it just kind of like make it up as you go each day? We have a program for lifting weights. That's one of our goals for the year. Both of us is to get, um, a lot stronger in powerlifting and adding really heavy weights. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I feel the best when I do that. He's naturally better at it, but I feel really good when I do it. Um, but for the most part, he kind of takes the lead. Just He's naturally very athletic, so it makes sense, and right. he has more experience with it. So he kind of takes the lead, but it's fun because it's together. Yeah, absolutely. And then um, what about, I heard you say intermittent fasting, and you're, well, you didn't say intermittent fasting, you said fasting. Um, where, are, so this is, this is a big question, but like nutritionally, where are you, and um, what's up with fasting? <laughs> Good question. So it's definitely a controversial one and I would definitely not give a blanket recommendation for everybody to do it. Right. Um, for me, we're both doing it for very specific reasons right now. And to preface, there are, you can create problems by fasting. If you have adrenal problems, if you have hormone problems, or if you, um, like have candida, it can get way worse if, when you fast, um, without, I don't have any of those problems. I have Hashimoto's, which I'm working on fully recovering from. So I had originally nodules on my thyroid. And I want to taper off my medicine, but first I want to make sure there's no potential nodules that could turn cancerous one day. Mm -hmm. So fasting has a ton of research in the cancer space and in longevity. Um, basically, the idea being once you've fasted for a few days, you go into a state of autophagy. So your body is killing off dead tissue, including things like tumors and cancer cells. Yeah. And you're also creating more stem cells naturally. So, um, And there's a study that shows like three days of complete fasting totally resets the microbiome. Yeah. So there's a lot of benefits. It's definitely, I would say, work with the doctor because I am. It's not something to undertake lightly, but 
Um, for us, it's something we've been incorporating this year with the idea that after this fast, I'm going to start tapering off my thyroid medicine and see how it goes. Hmm. So it's a very specific purpose. I'm not just doing it for fun to see how it feels. It's yeah, not right. actually very fun. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I will say once you've done it for a few days, the ketones kick in and your right. brain is just on fire. So I'm day five or six without eating right now. Wow. And my brain is good, but I'm you know, a little tired of water, but it's good. Yeah. Is it just water? Like nothing yeah, else? Just water. Yeah, I'm a purist when it comes to that because the research, um, Seafried, and there's a few others that did it with cancer patients, mm -hmm. and it was water only. Even things like black coffee could disrupt the fast. Basically, the idea is they don't have calories, but your body still has to deal with them. Yeah. So you're taking energy away from the process of breaking down tissue. Right. And their studies were fascinating as far as cancer patients, even terminal cancer patients, um, because once someone's at that stage, you get a little bit more leeway in what you can try with them. And even with like dogs who had cancer and they had people go into complete remission from fasting or they would combine fasting with chemotherapy and the chemotherapy would be so much more effective and the right. people wouldn't have the same negative effects. They wouldn't be like tired and nauseous afterwards for as long. So I think there's a huge place for it. And we know even um, with intermittent fasting, we know like caloric restriction, if you want to look at literature, caloric restriction is the strongest tie to longevity that we have. It's not very fun and no one wants to do it. Right. So fasting in a way gives you caloric restriction. You're not eating less food. You're eating less often. So yep. you're incidentally eating less food. Um, but it's just more fun because you can just eat what you actually want to eat at a meal or eat enough food instead of trying to restrict every single meal. Um, and I also think if your body's healthy, you don't have adrenal issues, you don't have gut issues, you don't have anything else going on, that it's really good for our bodies to be adaptable mm -hmm. and to be able to, if we had to, go without eating for a few days or to be able to burn fat or carbs or anything. I'm not a purist to say we should only go keto and we should never eat carbs because I think your body needs to be able to handle everything, mm -hmm. um, but at different times. So I'm right. a big fan of like kind of constantly throwing things at my body and making sure it can adapt. Yeah, it's really interesting. You know, I started playing around with intermittent fasting about a year ago and uh, I've, for the most part, I've eliminated my breakfast. I still drink coffee with, with I usually put butter and coconut oil in it. Um, you know, I guess if you're a purist, that wouldn't count as part of my intermittent fast, but I don't eat anything up until about noon usually. Well, and intermittent fasting is different because you're not going fully into autophagy right, and you're still right. keeping, you're not spiking your blood sugar, you're not, your cortisols are not changing. Right. So there is a lot more leeway with intermittent fasting. Um, I will say for women, because I hear from a lot of women, mm -hmm. um, any women who are listening, it doesn't seem to be a good idea to intermittent fast every day for women. Mm -hmm. Like you want to have at least a couple days a week where you spike your calories, spike your carbs, eat throughout the day. And most women, the week of their cycle, they need to eat more as well just right. to keep their hormones from downshifting. Huh. Um, I think intermittent fasting can be great, but again, I think it's like mix it up yep. constantly. Don't let your body adapt to it because for women, your thyroid and your, everything will downregulate to keep up with intermittent fasting if you do it every single day. It's, it's interesting because I've kind of naturally done that because I want to go out for breakfast on the weekend and I want to, you know, or make, I make my son eggs and I'm really hungry. I'm like, that looks really good. I'm going to have some myself. So I, I ended up doing that by accident you know, like not really worrying about it. If I not being too rigid with myself. Um, um, but it's, uh, I found that my appetite has shifted. Like this morning I am actually full. It's nine 15. I've had two cups of coffee with, with, I think a half tablespoon of butter and about a tablespoon of coconut oil. And I, I am not, I mean, like you, I don't want, I have no desire to eat any food. And it's such a strange feeling for me because I grew up with the mentality that, you know, breakfast is the most important meal of the day and you really can't get going without breakfast. And I have eaten breakfast like I used to eat huge shakes in the morning, four eggs. I would put four raw eggs in a shake. I would do a four egg omelet or, you know, go home and have a six egg omelet. My, my, my family would be like, what are you doing? You're eating it. You're eating us out of house and home. <laughs> um, so it's such an odd thing. Like I, it makes me wonder where was all that food going, you know, like what, <laughs> and you know, if I didn't, if I skipped breakfast one day, I would be starving by lunch. You know, it's a really weird, this whole experience is very weird. Some, you know, and I haven't lost any weight, which is also very weird. You know, like, where is it going? Where was it going? Why am I not? I, I just, there are a lot of questions still, which is kind of a fun place to be. Yeah. And I think like we talked about earlier, this is one of those things that totally goes back to personal experimentation and finding your own answers and being an advocate. Because I think when it comes to like macros and fasting and intermittent fasting, those are so personalized. And I like I've done a lot of gene analysis and I know that I have genes that make me able to fast really well. Mm -hmm. um, and I can actually handle 
ketosis really well, but ironically not saturated fats. Um, but I think it's very personal. So I think this is for sure one of those things that I would never tell someone else, like follow what I'm doing. I would say experiment and figure out what's going to work for you because every, every body is so different that way. You mentioned working with a doctor. How much do you have a functional medicine doctor that you see and how much blood testing are you doing? Like what, how do you manage that part of your health? So I actually, I worked with two doctors. They're both amazing. Um, but most of it I do myself because there's ways now to get labs yep. locally, most places, or you can get them like Everly Well or somewhere like that. But I have two doctors. One is Dr. Christensen, who was my original thyroid doctor, who totally helped me reverse all my health problems. And he's in Arizona, so he's hard to see. Um, but he has helped me like via Skype and that kind of stuff. Yep. And then now there's a new company called SteadyMD, and they are basically concierge medicine through your phone. And so you can pair up with a functional medicine doctor who, for instance, also has a background in powerlifting, who understands that women with muscle are going to have different hormones with women without muscle and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And they're on call 24 seven. You can video chat with them. I can like, even when my kids have had stuff, I can Skype them in the like middle of the night and be like, do I need to go to the emergency room? for this?" And they'll be like, yes or no. Um, So that's been awesome. And I think things like this are going to be leading the way into us being able to take more control for our health because it shifts that it's a very delicate balance, but it shifts that balance of we are in charge of our health and we are hiring these people. It makes it very clear mentally that way. Like we're hiring you as a consultant, like you're an app on our phone. You're not a white coat that's intimidating. And I think like this is really going to help revolutionize the healthcare industry. But even with that, like I, I always get lab tests on my own. I don't get them through my doctor and the results go to me first because I want to see the results. And then I give them to my doctor. And that small power shift is like, no, I, I am in charge of my own health information and I am sharing it with you because you're my consultant and I value your advice. It's not, I have to go to you to get advice or information about my own health. I think these like subtle shifts are really going to help what you talked about earlier with people thinking they have to always do what the doctor says because it does put the ball back in our court work. Yeah. I, but uh, you know, I'm just going to push back a little bit with that because you're in a position where you know a lot about, you know, what your labs mean and what your. I mean, I even struggle with remembering from one lab test to the next lab test. Like I can remember the cholesterol, the, the big ones, but you know, um, what do you, how do you, how do you recommend that people do that? That don't know, that don't have the breadth of knowledge that you have and the experience that you have in, in reading this stuff and remembering what they all mean and what they all do that weren't, you know, that, that, that don't read, you know, a book every half hour and <laughs> study for the boards. That's a great question. So practically I would say keep in like Evernote or Google docs somewhere, just keep all of your lab results. So you can always go back and compare. Right. Um, I have a, or just a, physical file if you prefer paper like keep so you can actually track these things over time i actually go so far as to graph them because it's really helpful to me to see the patterns um but even if someone isn't well versed in this i think that's actually even more of a reason to get the testing yourself first so when i first started on this i knew something was wrong with my body but i couldn't figure out what it was and eventually i had to get thyroid tests that figured out that there's definitely something wrong with my thyroid and then i had to find a doctor who could help me but because of that i like got these results back that said like abnormal 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 and i had to research it Mm -hmm. and i feel like then even if this isn't your background you have will have read some stuff you will have researched and tried to understand so you're not going into a doctor in a situation where they then are the only source of information and you have to listen to what they say if you can come in with good questions and they understand that you are willing and ready to be an advocate for your own health first of all even conventional doctors which i i love doctors i'm not trying to belittle doctors at all Mm -hmm. if they see you come in with the hard questions and with a willingness to take charge they're willing to say like, okay, well, you don't have to go straight to drugs. There are lifestyle things you can do, but they know most people aren't going to want to do those things. Right. So if you come in showing that you are ready to take charge and to try to make changes for your health, they're going to be so much more willing to work with you typically, even conventional medicine doctors. I found that across the board. Hmm. Yeah, it, because it's so difficult in the world with there, there's so many conflicting opinions. Like I didn't ask you yet, or I, I didn't go back and ask you yet about your diet and your nutrition, you know, your thoughts on nutrition, but you know, even in just in the area of nutrition, there are so many conflicting bits of information all over the place. And with your health, it's even worse, you know, like 20 people say this thing and they're, 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 they're 300 different camps around what that the the interpretation of your blood metrics could be um so it's very i think it's very difficult for the normal consumer to to kind of wade through that and then spend the time that it takes to do the research to figure out those answers yourself it's a it's a really daunting task and then figuring out the person who are you who are you going to trust you know when when this 
when this set of um, blood tests comes back in this way and three different doctors tell you three different things, who do you, how do you know what to believe? Like it's, I, I don't, I, do you have an answer for that? Like, I don't, I don't have an answer for that. I don't know. That's a really tough thing. I think partially at the end of the day, it does somewhat come down to intuition when you have multiple right. doctors saying different things. Um, but I, I also think, yeah, like, yeah, it is hard. I'm not saying it's easy to research all of this stuff. And it's certainly not easy to have a health problem and have to try to figure out the answers yourself. But also, like, what else in our life that we do is more important than that? Right. Like, right. it's such a priority. And I think that mental shift it needs to happen more in the U.S. of us like not trying to just outsource that to someone else because it's the easy way, but right. to take, and I know people like you, so many of us are speaking about like nutrition is important and lifestyle is important and what you come in contact with. And people are starting to make those connections across the board. Yep. And I think that's going to really help too, because when you realize things in your daily life can impact directly your, how you feel and your lab results, you have much more power to change it and you have much more motivation to research it because you can actually affect the outcome. I think for a long time it was the docs did have all the answers or they were the only one who had the answers. And now we have all of the knowledge in the world literally at our fingertips. Yep. And so um, I am hopeful too that more and more companies, and I'm trying to do this as well as I write, will try to clarify and wade through all that science and make a, a very simple to follow instruction of what these things mean and how to interpret them and how to find an advocate because at the end of the day, like we all need someone in our court. There yeah. will be eventually medical things and we need someone in our court. And I, um, I mean, I want to say out loud for sure. I love doctors. I think that most, if not all doctors go into it because they truly care about people. You don't get through eight years of medical school because you don't care about people. Right. Um, and I think they, a lot of them are as frustrated by the system as we are. Yeah. And so I think rather than like demonizing conventional doctors, we need to look at them as being partners in this change, hopefully. And I really have hope that, that over the next 10 years or so, we're going to see a shift in the medical community and in availability of easy information about this, but it is, I feel like we're still at that pivot point where it's pretty difficult. Um, but I also have seen firsthand the value of putting in the work and researching it so that you can get to the answers in a much more efficient way. Well, I love what you said, you know, um, and I, w I want to just kind of bring this out is the, the importance of your intuition and following your gut. And I mean, literally following your gut and not literally following your gut. Um, the, the importance of knowing what's in alignment for you, because nobody can tell you the right answer for you. And, you know, hey, God bless you. If you think conventional medicine and prescription drugs and, and going on chemo is going to be the treatment for you, then, then you have to go with that. I mean, you, you, right? I mean, like that to me, alignment with who you are on the inside, in spite of what I might know or you might know or, you know, the us thinking we know better is probably a, a better route um, than, than going against whatever you feel is right on the inside. Yeah, a hundred percent. I also think the future of health in general is personalization and variation. I don't think, like I said, I don't think it's good to do anything every day. And I think we are so personalized and we're just starting to understand that. And that's what I've kind of at like conferences and events that I've been trying to say for years. It's like when we have these paleo versus vegan versus keto versus yeah. all these, I'm like, what if we're all right? What if we all found out what worked for us? Yeah. And what we should all be preaching is how to help other people figure out what's right for them. Because especially bio biochemically and biologically, like we are all so different. And yeah. what works great for me is not going to be the answer for most people. It'll be great, the answer for some people. Um, but it works for me because it took me a long time to figure out and trial and error and figure out what actually works for my body. And I think that's what we all have to do. Because unfortunately, um, like our grandparents and great-grandparents, they didn't have the amount of chemical inputs that we have to deal with on a given day. They didn't deal with EMFs. They didn't have the stress levels we have today. Yep. They didn't have as much stuff as we have today. They had in a lot of ways, much calmer, simpler lives. And the food supply was so much better, even 50 to a hundred years ago. Yep. We don't have the luxury of just doing the status quo anymore. If we want to actually be really healthy, unfortunately, right. I am hopeful we can get back to that. Um, but I think we all have an obligation to figure out what works for us and what works for our kids and to set up those nutritional foundations and lifestyle foundations to, to be able to live a normal life just because we have so many more things we face than our previous generations did. Right, right. What, so let's broach the nutrition topic because it's, um, you know, it's really in front of everybody's face at least three times a day. Well, at least two times a day for most people, unless you're fasting. Um, what, uh, where, where do you stand? I mean, I, 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 you know, like I'm not trying to lock you into anything. Um, 
Um, but I'm curious, like, how do you tell people to proceed when it comes to nu- nutrition and, and what, what they eat and how do you, and how do you do that with your kids Two kind of two parts to the question? Good question. Okay. So I don't, I, I try to encourage people as much as possible to figure out their own answers, but I also realize people want a little bit of guidance. Yeah. So I think there are some general rules. Like I, I'm yet to hear anyone make the case that sugar is healthy. I think if we all completely avoided sugar as a population, we would be so much healthier. So that's one thing that's completely on my no list along with vegetable oils because they are completely chemically fake and our bodies never had to encounter those until about 60 years ago. So um, a couple things like that are totally off the, the ca- counter for me. Um, same with like most processed foods. I don't have processed food in my house and I don't eat it. So the, personally, and again, this is just what works for me when I'm not fasting, my diet is um, moderate amount of clean protein, which I do really well with fish and some beef, some turkey, or that kind of bison. Um, my husband hunts a wild game, but small amounts always vary. So I don't ever eat the same protein every single day. Mm-hmm. So we mix it up a lot. Um, like traditional foods, like fermented foods and broths and slow foods that existed for years, and then seasonal vegetables. So I'm really big on eating what's in season. And I've realized over the years as we've done this that I now crave what's in season, and there's a mm-hmm. reason for it. So like in the spring, I crave cilantro like crazy. I can eat like a gallon of cilantro pesto, but that's it kind of cilantro grows at that time for a reason because we just came through the winter of eating like more like like meaty, potatoey, starchy foods in the winter, yep. and that really helps flush your liver and do a lot of things in your body. So I think back there's a ton of intuition there, and it's like teaching our bodies how to get back in touch with that. Um, but at the end of the day, it's like I said, I don't think anyone has ever made the case that sugar is healthy. And I'm yet to see people make the case that vegetables aren't healthy unless you have a specific sensitivity. Mm-hmm. So we center around every meal, um, moderate amounts of protein, lots and lots of vegetables and moderate to high amounts of healthy fats, especially for the kids. And I do make sure the kids get enough carbs, especially kids need them a lot. Yep. So we'll do starchy vegetables, sweet potatoes, squashes, that kind of thing. And even with the kids rice, because I think for my kids, at least they don't have sensitivities. White rice is fine. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of the core of our diet. But I also know that won't work for everyone. And this is us after having all gone through genetic testing, IgG testing. like all. So I basically took all of those, made a chart, and these are what work for all of us. Wow. And that's what we stick to. Um, but we vary it. And it, when we're traveling, it doesn't always happen. And sometimes we eat food that we wouldn't normally eat, and that's fine. Um, and to the note of the kids, I made a really conscious effort that I would never – I don't want to create a, a thing ever where food is bad. Because food is just nourishment. And when yep. we start giving food a moral implication, it gets really confusing for kids. Yeah, right. So even though we don't eat sugar, I don't label any food as bad. I explain what it does to their body just so they can make the decision. And I don't have it in the house. So the way I see it, when they're in my house, I'm responsible for feeding them and for nourishing them. And that's that's my level of responsibility. So I'm not going to have things in the house that aren't nourishing and helpful to them. Mm-hmm they are responsible even in my house for deciding if they want to eat that food or not. And if they're hungry or not, I don't want to force them to eat food if they're not hungry. So if they at a given meal decide they don't like the food or they're not hungry, I will not force them to eat it. Hmm. They can make that decision because I'm like, you are autonomous. You are in control of your body. You need to listen to your body and know if you're hungry. And if you don't like a food, I mean, fasting for one meal is not going to hurt even a kid. Right. So that's right. kind of, we, we talk about that, the division of responsibility. And I tell them like, my job is to provide food for you and your job is to decide if you want and need to eat it or not. And I'm not going to pressure you and you're not going to pressure me. And that's how the responsibility works. And that said, when they're not in my house, I am not following them around telling them what to eat or not eat. And I realize that kids with healthy guts who get a lot of activity. If they choose to eat a cupcake at a birthday party, it's not actually going to kill them. Mm -hmm. They will feel terrible. And that's great because then they learn from it, but it's not going to kill them. I think it goes back to respecting them even when they're young as people and respecting how much they can actually understand and how they can most of the time make really good decisions if they're educated and respected. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of parents, and I see this even a little bit in my own life, like when food is either tied to reward, like birthday parties or good grades, everything results in sugary treats. Yeah. It creates the feedback loop in the brain that like happy times equal sugar. And yeah. then when you're sad, you crave sugar because you want happy times. Yeah, right. Or conversely, if food becomes bad, either they become orthorexic and they're afraid to eat everything, or it becomes the forbidden thing. Like how so many of us like maybe in college drink too much because it was, or even high school, it was the forbidden thing. Right. So we wanted to try it. Yep. So I wanted to avoid both of those pitfalls. And my kids are still young, so I haven't navigated all the teenage years yet. 
but um, so far it seems to be working. So last year in our new community, we uh, had to navigate Halloween for the first time. We had never really had that as an option before. Uh-huh. And they wanted to dress up. I was like, that's great. We're going to spend time with friends. Um, and, and they wanted to go trick or treating. And I was like, it's your decision, what you do with your body. And they all went trick or treating and nobody got any candy. They just wanted the experience of going oh. with their friends. They didn't want the candy. They, they, they had no bags. They didn't go up to the houses and ask for. They, they just said, no, thank you. They just wanted to hang out with their friends. Wow. And I was shocked because I didn't tell them not to. And, yeah, and right. that goes back to, I think when we respect kids or adults, anybody, when you're trying to teach someone, mm-hmm. um, I think when you respect people and care about them and educate them and trust them, like we sometimes underestimate how amazing people are. Yeah. Right. Even kids. Right. That's really cool. Yeah. My, my son doesn't, my son definitely does that. Um, and there's a big, you know, thing with him and his friends is how much candy did you get? But his candy, he still got candy in his little drawer that he keeps stuff. First of all, we give away probably five sixths of the, of the candy he gets and he does it voluntarily. He doesn't really want it all, but there's still candy in the drawer from Halloween that he hasn't eaten. So he, you know, he's not that fixated on candy. Now we, the, the, the challenge in our house is bread and you know hot dogs and hamburger buns and pizza and um you know he's around it 24 7 with because all his friends how all they they all eat and um uh and you know and ice cream and you know all that all that stuff so it's it's a regular challenge i i am fall much more on the side of kind of where you are where i wouldn't don't really want it in my house and my wife is not really 100 percent on board with that so that also is a tough it's a tough thing. Well, and yeah, marital harmony is also a very important thing in a yeah, household. So yeah. you have to definitely weigh carefully there for sure. Yeah. We, fortunately we will, we'll get sprouted grain bread, which is, I think probably the best of, you know, like the not so great. Um, um, but yeah, it's a, it's an ongoing struggle. The, the, the pizza, especially my God, the kids eat so much pizza and, and hamburgers. Um, that's kind of their go-to. So well, and part of that, they're fighting an uphill battle because every restaurant, everything, society tells them that's what's appropriate the kid food. Yeah, right. That's another Macaroni thing I'd love to see reformed yeah. eventually. Like in, in France and in Italy, there first of all, there is no kid's menu. Right. They'll bring like a half plate of the adult food. But if there was like a kid's sized menu, it would all be like meats and vegetables and whatever the parents are eating. It's not yeah. a separate thing. And I think we do our kids a disservice when we are like, oh, the only things they're going to like are chicken nuggets and hamburgers and pizza. Totally. Yeah, right. Do you... um. Uh, oh crap. The, the question just flew out of my head. Something about, Oh, pasta. What do you do about pasta? And did you eat pasta? Did you guys eat pasta when you were in Italy and in Europe? Is a good question. So my husband, um, is Sicilian by descent and he actually, we've done all the testing. He does great with gluten, especially if it's fermented like sourdough and it's an ancient grain. He does totally fine and actually great with it. He can't, he doesn't do well with rice, beans, or potatoes at all Wow. or corn, but oh. he does fine with gluten. So again, it's back to the personalization because yep. in general, most people would say, gluten is it great um and i don't do much dairy at home just because i don't feel great when i do a lot of dairy in europe we did we like because we were visiting family vineyards and these people were literally cooking the best of what they had to share with us and i'm like you don't tell an italian grandmother who's 80 years old who just spent six hours cooking that you can't eat her you just don't that's right. that's way worse than whatever's going to happen yeah, right right um, back to community back to the community <laughs> piece <laughs> exactly and interestingly there i felt great it didn't affects me at all. Like we didn't gain any weight. We felt great. Um, and I think that goes back to their food, food culture is so much better than ours. Like we yeah. saw them make the pasta literally out of an ancient grain wheat and water. There was no wow. chemical additives. There was the wheat was grown on their little organic farm. It wasn't sprayed by anything. So yeah. it's a different level of food. Yeah, like right, they had organic right. tomatoes. They just picked, they had mozzarella de buffalo that they made from the milk of a water buffalo in their yard. Like it's, we don't have that kind of food culture here, yeah. um, but t- we did fine with it, even though that's not our normal diet. So wow. Wow. again, I think we'll, we probably have a lot more genetic leeway in what we could eat if we didn't make our food so crappy. Yeah. If somebody was interested in getting the kind of testing done that, that you and your husband and your family have done, where, where did you go to do that and what kind of testing is, is involved? Yeah. So we did um, nutrition genome with us and all of our kids. And that's the full genetic test. But the reason I like them over someone like 23 and me is that they, the, their founders have a background in nutrition and biochemistry. So they give you this 50 page report that basically explains based on your genes, what you need to eat. Wow. So it's instead of like talking about getting reports back and having no idea what they mean, if you got the original 23 and me data back, you're like, I have no idea what all these random snippets mean that's or me. what to do. I did, I did that. <laughs> Are, Still sitting there. there. Like, it's, like it's, Rhonda Patrick has one. You can put it in and interpret it. And uh-huh. there's Genetic Genie and a couple others. But 
nutrition genome just gives you everything right from the start, even down to like, okay, because of this gene, you have an increased need for magnesium because you're not efficiently doing this process. Right. Or because of this gene, you're going to fast really, really well. Or because of this gene, you should never fast or whatever. They explain all of that. So to me, that was the most helpful test for sure. Okay. Um, and then just for as adults, especially, I feel like if you have any gut issues or for me with thyroid, um, with tapering off medicine, I wanted to make sure I'm in a very low inflammation state. Mm -hmm. So I ran IgG tests through Everly Well and also hormone tests just to make sure everything was good before I start messing things up. Um, and so I'm avoiding any foods. I didn't have any that I highly reacted to, but I'm avoiding foods that I even moderately reacted to, of which there was a few. Um, so I'll be for the next couple months while I'm tapering off, I'll be off of dairy and for sure gluten and anything inflammatory and focusing on like a lot of salmon and fish and anchovies and sardines, like very low inflammation foods mm -hmm. and lots of vegetables just to keep the inflammation down. Um, and the IgG ones are interesting with kids. I know a lot of parents who have tested their kids for IgG issues, um, which what is, is different IgG? than- So it's different than food allergies. So food allergies would be done by a doctor and that shows uh -huh. like anaphylaxis or serious allergies. Uh -huh. um, IgG, and there's others as well, um, IgF I believe and maybe IgA, but they're, um, food sensitivity. So you're not going to have an anaphylactic reaction, but they're causing some inflammation in your body. Right. So um, we did that with the kids just to see. And I know parents who have had kids who had like behavioral problems or couldn't sit still and they figured out it was like two foods that who would have known because it can be like kale and sunflower seeds, which are right. my two right now. Like those are actually like huh. normally considered healthy foods. Yeah, right. And, and I'm reacting to them. Huh. And the gut's always evolving. So typically you can eventually heal that. But for kids, if it's like if there's a constant irritation in the gut, especially something they're eating every day, that can really lead to sleep problems and behavior problems. So that was helpful with our kids um, just for their sleep and all that. And then my husband and I have also done biome, which is a gut test, which is so basically the genetics is the DNA of what's inputting. Biome is kind of like the RNA of what's outputting through your body. So mm -hmm. what your gut's actually handling in real time. Mm -hmm. And so kind of lining those two up was super helpful just to see like it's kind of the, like when I fast, I measure my blood ketones to mm -hmm. see what's in my blood. And then I also measure breath acetone to see what's actually being used. So it's kind of like that kind of ebb and flow of like the two, the two inputs you can check. Right. Um, and those have been our main ones that have been just super helpful as far as having um, our own be advocates for our own health. And I yeah. feel like you don't need a doctor to do any of those. And yeah. they all explain the, the results really well. So you're not left cool. researching stuff. You have no idea what it is. Yeah. And I, I think it's also really important to remember that, that uh, if you do do one of these tests or a bunch of these tests that getting the test done is only really the first part of the equation. You have to actually do something as a result of the tests, you know, like I think people very often are inundated with the amount of information they get in the world. Like I, like 23 and me is a great example for me. I got the test done. I got all this information and I d did absolutely nothing with it, partly because I don't really understand the report and I didn't really take the time to, to, you know, to, to, to understand it, but it doesn't really do any good to get the results of all this stuff and then do nothing as a result. So leveraging however you need to leverage it, like if you need to see a doctor or you need to, you need to put money on it, or you need to get someone else to kind of lever you into doing something, you, you have to do something as a result of what you see. For sure. Having a kettlebell in your house is not going to make you stronger and yeah, having right. in your house is not going to make you healthier. Exactly. You actually, but... you actually have to pick the damn thing up. <laughs> <laughs> Katie, I really appreciate you being with me this morning. You, you've um, your generosity and your 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 willingness to share. I mean, my God, we, I could I, I say this a lot, but like the amount of questions that I could come up with to ask you are probably limitless. Oh. <laughs> so, um, and I and I'm just really inspired by your the kind of the way your your intentional the intentional way with which you've set your life up and the life for your kids and the life for your family and the way you're taking it out and experimenting and exploring and adventuring. And, um, you know, it's really inspiring. It's really, really, really cool. There's a, there's a reason why you are looked at as a, as a, you know, thought leader in the, in the world of wellness and well being. So thank you for everything that you do. Thanks, Andy. I can't believe time has flown by. You're so easy to talk to. It's been so much fun. <laughs> it has. I looked at my clock. I'm like, damn it. <laughs> I want to keep going. Um, well, uh, yeah, thanks again, and uh, we'll have to do it again because, yeah, I, this, this can't be uh, one and done. Awesome. Absolutely. Hey, it's Andy, and thanks so much for listening. If you want to know more about what I'm learning each month, head over to andypetronic.com and subscribe to my monthly newsletter. If you were touched, moved, or inspired by anything you heard today, chances are someone else you know would be too. 
please take a moment to think about who and send them a link to this episode. And if you're super stoked, please head over to iTunes to write a review. The best way to keep current on guests and episodes is to subscribe so that the latest one will automatically get delivered straight to your phone. The apps I use for this are Apple Podcasts, Overcast, or Pocket Casts. The Andy Petronic Podcast is produced by our team, Winslow Jenkins, Becca Borowski, and Ernie Hurtado. Big thanks to Nikki Grudadaria for the artwork. You can find all of our episodes, links, and complete show notes at wholelifechallenge.com forward slash podcast. I'm Andy Petronic. Thanks for listening.